going to bring on the moderator today, from Brian Vines from Consumer Reports, along with Cape War Center, have been our great collaborators for today. So let's welcome Brian to the stage as our moderator. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you have a mic. Hey. So again, thank you for having us. Thanks to all Tech is Human for being such great partners in this endeavor. I was fortunate enough to uh, spend the summer after having been drafted by Consumer Reports' Leah Fishman uh, to go around making this meeting some of the most interesting and intriguing people doing phenomenal work. And at least two of them are here right now and a new friend that is probably familiar to you. So I'd love to, uh, Lily, I'm looking at you. Lily Genghis, who is the chief technology community officer at the Cape Horse Center. Our friends and uh, colleagues in this endeavor is here. I'm uh, Crystal, Dr. Crystal Grant, uh, who is a technology fellow with the ACLU's, I wrote it down, Crystal, so I can get it right. Uh, Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project is also here. She was featured in the film, and Nabiha Syed, the CEO of one of my favorite clicks, The Markup, is here. So this is our panel. Thank you for uh, being as welcoming as you rightly should be. And again, I'm, I'm Brian, I work at Consumer Reports, and I just, like from the beginning, your microphones are on, they're lovely, they're people, they're technologists here. So, uh, so just from the beginning, thank you for being here and sharing your time and really having the bravery to appear on a panel that is devoid of white men. So thank you for Feels showing up. Feels comfortable, feels good. Feels good. So in the interest of you know tech being human, let's start at a very human place that keys into all of you are accomplished folks who are succeeding in various fields of endeavor that don't necessarily automatically go to responsible tech in the AI space, but you find yourselves here. So I'm just wondering how your personhood has bled into what isn't entirely in your job description, but you find yourself being people who are at the forefront of fairness in this new landscape. So Lily, do you wanna start with just putting the tech into the human and like how you're presenting bleeds into your job and in this intersection? Definitely, first of all, thank you to everyone that's here. You made the time to come. And I know you all could be anywhere else, but you're here because you're fellow nerds like all of us. And you care about, what, about the moment and the implications. And I really hope that the, the three segments that you all just saw just really woke you up in a sense to be excited about the potential solutions of the technology can bring, but also being able to understand the complexities that are at hand. And for me, this work is personal and professional. So I'm the chief tech community officer at the Caper Center. People are like, what does that mean? I figure it as I go, but at the end of the day, it's really looking at the intersection, especially for the Caper Foundation. We are focused on making sure that we're increasing not only pathways, but economic upward mobility for talent of color, specifically black, Latinx, native communities, to persevere through computer science education, to get the tech job, to be the tech founder, and eventually be the investor. At the same time, for me, as an immigrant from Bolivia, not having, not knowing the language, I've seen my mom, myself, be impacted by the technologies across the space. And I did start my career as an engineer, so it has a little bit of, of a lot of different lived journeys uh, that I bring to the work. But I also know that the moment for now is not the moment just for the computer scientists. It's not the moment for just the engineers. This is really the moment to have our neighbors, our families, the social scientists, the educators, the youth, everyone really be involved in making sure that this technology that we are creating and also using, whether we like it or not, right? We're all to some degree complicit in this moment. And so I think that this is really a very important time in our history as humans in this world, knowing the technologies that we came from. And for me personally, as somebody who has been in the other side of being, uh, I started as an electrical software engineer working on the defense industry. And really early on in my career, I realized that this American dream that I thought that you go to college, you get a, a good paying job and you stay there. But I was like, what am I building? So I had some of my first big ethical questions as I started to work on what I learned were eventually ballistic missiles that shoot out, out of submarines. And so at that moment, I'm, I'm thinking about 
Is this how I want to spend my time? Are these the problems that I want to solve? And I understand the complexities, political, economic, everything that comes along with that sector, but I knew that that's not where I wanted to be. So I left, pivoted, bunch of different career switches from consulting to now where I'm at, at philanthropy and really making sure that we are um, empowering each other to know that we have an agency in this moment. And you each have, as part of an ecosystem, a role to play. And so for me, this is the role that I'm playing in and making sure that I'm bringing my lived experience, being able to bring in all these different personal and professional experiences to make sure that we are reaching the communities that may not be in this room and making sure that we're reaching them in a way that is authentic, that it's involving and making sure that they're part of the process because if the pandemic taught us anything at the moment is that we're all together, right? We all depend on each other one way or the other. And so I think we have to make sure that as in this moment of way more technologies that we remember the human in us, what brings us together and make sure that we are building something that it's actually closing gaps of access, improving people's lives and not widening it. So I, I, I would love to hear some from each of you, especially just from my experience researching and talking with people, including you, Dr. Grant, about the number of, in particular, women of color who are really at the forefront of these talks. I, I would love to get your impressions about what's frankly lost and gained from women of color frankly being hurdled with another thing on top of their actual job descriptions, making this space and carving out fairness things on top of the things that are really on their nameplate at their positions. Yeah, thank you for that question. And thank you also everyone for being here. Um, I'm not surprised that women of color are are pushing for change. I think that that seems to, that happens often in, uh, in like times of, um, of social movements, where it's when you have multiple marginalized identities, um, you it's a lot easier to see how systems can be working against you and to and realize like no one's going to come save you and speak out um, on your behalf. So kind of having to step into that role yourself. Um, so it has been really inspiring for me watching even other women in in the medical devices docu series, uh, Dr. Jebru and Scott, um, uh, who are also like yeah behemoths in this field, um, talking about this need for equity in tech. Um, so kind of like your first question, my um, path here was through um, not through like engineering or computer science, it was through biology. Um, I like uh, got my PhD in genetics, and in the process of writing my dissertation, um, just kind of was writing a bit of like stream of consciousness and found myself saying um, my frustrations with the field and how a lot of the technical tools um, used to like predict health for people worked best on people of European descent and didn't work as well on black people or Latinx, et cetera. And yeah, I remember thinking like, oh, this is a real problem in genetics and genetics only. And then, leave, and then finishing my PhD and seeing like, oh no, it's all of tech, not just um, this sort of the, the field that I know best. Um, so yeah, that's what um, kind of started me on my path and, and led me um, to where I am now at ACLU um, working on these issues. But yeah, I, I, um, I think it's often going to be um, people with multiple marginalized identities who are going to be the ones that are going to speak out um, just in the realization that, a, I mean, A, you have less to lose, and B, um, uh, no, one, uh, yeah, no one can say it sort of better than you um, with your own voice. I saw a head nod, Nabia. Oh. I feel like because uh, when you have multiple marginalized identities, sometimes you have a front row seat to how things work and don't work. Um, I love this question about what's the human aspect that brings you to the table, because it's nice to get human with, each, with one another, right? Um, so my story is I, uh, I grew up in a Muslim community to Pakistani immigrant parents in Southern California and came of age right around 9-11 uh, time. Right? So the idea of surveillance as a distant thing or even a corporate thing is not how I first experienced the concept. I experienced what it meant to have people say, shh, don't make trouble. Don't say that, don't post that, don't say it on the phone, don't talk like that because you don't know if you say the wrong word to the wrong person whether someone's gonna come to your house, round you up, and you're not gonna see them for a while. Right? That happened in New York, it happened in Orange County, it happened across this country, it happened in Chicago. This was a real lived experience of surveillance. And so I grew up, I went to law school, so not engineering, not biology, I became a lawyer. 
Um, and I became a media and free speech lawyer because I had this very, very simple thought, which is if only people knew, right? If only people heard from other people what it was really like, they would do something different. That's a fundamentally optimistic perspective. I recognize that. <laughs> But that was the motivating factor. And so now I'm at The Markup, which is a nonprofit news organization that challenges technology to serve the public good. What does that mean? So many technologies are built with private incentives in mind. Who gets a buck? Who can profit? Can we scale? What do we do here? Who's speaking on behalf of the public? Who's making sure that that voice of the public has a seat at the table? And in order to ensure that that voice is you know, informed, speaking with knowledge, sharing and seeing each other in community, journalism plays a role, right? We can amplify, we can investigate, we can provide data, which is kind of our special sauce at the markup. We can really do this um, in a way that we think is meaningful and defines a problem set so the solution set follows, right? And it's really all about giving people information for agency. And uh, it's, a, it's a very personal mission because I know what it looks like when tech in the defense industry, in law enforcement, other places, doesn't work for people. I know what that means for your humanity. And in something as simple as a device, you can go down to CVS and get to clamp on to the end of your finger that is meant to tell your blood oxygen level. One of the discussions we had in the course of bad input on medical devices was, you know, if this technology works for 80% of the world or people right here in the US, is it throwing the baby out with the bathwater if it doesn't work as well for you dark-skinned people? Like, it's still, it's still okay. And someone said, you know, well, if you went to a restaurant and they said only 20% of the people who eat here have food poisoning. <laughs> like, that, that, like, do we shutter it or do we keep cranking out the food? So the question in there somewhere is, if we're in a sort of triage situation right now, looking at technology on multiple fronts, I would love to know where do you stop the bleed from each of your respective positions? I'll start, uh, and we'd love to make sure, there's so much expertise here that I'm like, ah. Um, I would just say, like, as I shared my little bit of my story, right, as I started as an engineer, one of the things, some of the first projects that I, I was working on was, like, all the edge case testing. So when, we, when you think about the margins, the edge cases, like, how do we break these systems, right? So my brain has been trained in being, like, that 1% when you're working on something that needs to have, like, the millimeter, centimeter accuracy matters, right? And so I've been trained in that perspective at an early point to be like, no, we have to be making sure that we're looking at those edge cases because that's going to be what breaks down the system. And I think for me personally, it's, it's a full circle being able to be in this space and being able to share that experience, but also making sure that we are educating ourselves and actually challenging ourselves, especially those who are in those rooms that get to do not, not necessarily the implementation of coding, but the design. The folks who have the first concept, ask yourself, is that something that we need? Just because you can build it, should you build it? Just because we can scale it, should you scale it? And I think that these are questions that as we've been going through um, the education sector, right? When we think about it, we're not, if we're losing some of the critical thinking at an early age, right? Whether you're in, in elementary to middle school or even in college and you're kind of just being pushed into uh, a space where you're not supposed to even really ask some of those critical questions, we start to lose that, that, uh, the sense of critical thinking. And I think especially with one of the, the spaces that we're in now, looking at all the everyday headlines that we're seeing around AI and what's working, what's not working, and the dystopia, utopia things that are happening. On the flip side, it's, it's, really, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how we can bring back the critical thinking to everyone and at the same time, how we can hold everyone accountable to make sure that they're thinking about those edge cases, because that will break the system. And I think when you're, if you're not that person that is being impacted directly, there's a lot of privilege that sits with you. But as, as Nabib has shared, like, when it's your family, when it's yourself, when it's your health, your life, that's a danger. When it's your freedom that you've lost, that matters. And if that impacts your family, that impacts your loved ones, so it has different factors that I think it's super critical to make sure that we are acknowledging because that 1%, the 0.001% matters because that could be a life and death situation for somebody. And so I think for the folks who get to be in those spaces, that's a challenge that I provide to you 
Challenge yourself to be that critical thinker as you're approaching these problems. Challenge your teammates. Speak up, think of different solutions. If, think about who you, the problems that you're solving for. Are the people that, that are you, do you have their problem? Or are the people that have those problems part of the process of even thinking about how to conceptualize the solution? And I think a lot of the times, and I speak as a software engineer from previous life, we forget about that, right? We, we get so lost in like, that the coding language and style and how fast it runs, we forget that it's about humans. So um, yeah, I can go on, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, very well said. Um, I think the way to stop the bleed is through regulation. I think that's what several people in the film also were saying. It's like the like adage of like not letting the fox guard the hen house. Um, these companies could, they can't self-regulate. They could, they wouldn't do it well. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, my interest has especially been in uh, medical devices and the increasing use of an application of AI in the like clinical and medical setting. And it's been really shocking. I Maybe mean, I shouldn't be shocked. I'm also an optimist. But like day to day, to day just the new ways that people have found to inject AI into um, our, our healthcare and clinical care to save a buck. Um, the newest push is like using AI AI um, uh, as like a scribe during um, encounters with um, your doctor, and then using large language models like the chat GPT thing that we've all seen um, to like then type that up and like maybe even diagnose. It's a nightmare, and they're gonna throw computer vision in there too to try to assess how you're moving. Um, it's just throwing more tech and more tech and, and just zero regulation. And I understand that there's been a, a light touch in the regulatory space. Um, in, around tech in general and around medical technology and that there are a lot of instances in which the combination of a human working with AI can be better than like either alone. Um, but uh, the, our current approach of just being like, well, we don't understand these tools well enough to regulate them um, just isn't working. Or the, or the fact that uh, largely the FDA um, uh, has kind of said, well, we're not going to really touch like all of these other tools, but we'll work on these, on these couple of um, uh, instances of, of AI and then slowly backpedaled last year and said, actually, we probably should be doing more. So I think it's, it's just uh, a matter of realizing like this is, this tech unfortunately is here to stay. Um, and for regulation Regulators feeling comfortable and empowered enough themselves to say, like, it, it is our role to ensure that these things are fair and equitable or transparent and actually functional. Because, of course, the company, when approaching, you know, the, these exhausted <laughs> positions or, or hospital administrators is, go is going to try to sell them their snake oil of, like, this thing works 100, 110% of the time. Um, so, yeah, I, I see uh, regulation really as the answer, especially in, like, the medical device and regulatory space. And also just uh, increasing baseline requirements of, um, of uh, uh, real world data sets in which um, the people on whom the device is trained actually reflect the population. I remember when looking into um, policies around um, pulse oximeters, so the little devices um, that you use during COVID to test your blood oxygen level, the official rule at the FDA is that you must include at least two dark skinned people in your study. Does that sound like enough people to you guys? No, right? That is our official rule to this day. At least two. At least two. <laughs> Um, so yeah, basic things like this need to change in the regulatory space. Uh, the great thing about being last on the panel is that you get to just uh, build on the genius of the people before you. So I think to, how do you stem the tide, right? What do you do? Uh, to pick up on the regulation front, I think there's actually five, five things that I keep looking at uh, that make me optimistic. The first is participation, right? We do need more than at least two people <laughs> in these studies. We need to create the scaffolding so you and you and you and you have a say on the algorithms that decide whether you get a mortgage or whether you graduate from school or whether you get hired for a job, you need to be in the room or a representative of you needs to be in the room. And that, that doesn't just happen because someone like, you know, sends you a survey. We have to create the scaffolding for this participation, and that is happening in interesting spaces, and we can talk about that in a second. You need transparency. We gotta know what the what is. You can't have meaningful participation if you don't have transparency around, well, how often is this being used? What are the, like, what's the data here? And we need to collect that in order to have the real transparency. And there's some regulatory effort to try to get transparency in different realms of housing, education, hiring, jobs, all that kind of thing. You need forecasting, right? This is a David Robinson who wrote a great book, Voices in the Code, talks about forecasting. You need someone to sit down and be like, okay, I'm making this thing. 
what are all the ways it could go wrong, right? You need someone to stop and think about that quite critically before a product goes to market, before you roll it out to communities, and you can regulate that. You can require, why not, you know, 18 months after you get your Series A, you have to do a forecast. Why not? That's, a, that's something that VCs could decide today, yesterday, do it, if any of you are in here. Um, <laughs> auditing, right? Auditing is a thing where after you've rolled it out, Right After you roll something out, you can check and see, did that go the way that we think it went? No investor would ever invest in a company without audited financials, okay? You don't, why not audit algorithms to make sure that they're up to snuff? That's also a thing that regulation is doing. And the last one is a real pet peeve of mine, and I think there's more conversation around it, and it is recourse. It's not enough to know, it's not enough to be listened to, it's not enough to have some experts check it somewhere. I want to know that if my mortgage got denied, and I think something weird happened here, I have a right to recourse. I can call someone and be like, excuse me, what is happening here? Check this, right? And that is a space where I'm actually not seeing as many sort of regulatory efforts, but I think there's a lot of promise there because that's the piece that gives you agency. <coughs> That's the piece that brings you back in full circle to say, this isn't working for me and I get to tell you. And so I think there are tangible things that we can do. This is why I'm an optimist, okay? Um, there's tangible things that we can do and they're slowly happening, slow. I love an optimist, thank you. And uh, in the interest of the first being last, I'm gonna start with you now. Oh, you can, you can I'm not kick gonna off sound as good genius. if I'm first. <laughs> <laughs> but I also uh, wanted to uh, bring you all into the conversation. So if you uh, do have a question that you'd like to put to our panel, just give me a hand. We're an uh, intimate enough group, I can see you. But right after this, <laughs> I got a microphone. <laughs> no, but I just wanted to ask Nabia, if we are, like you are intimately knowledgeable about one of the sort of Herculean tasks that we had to make several points of entry for folks to get in on this thing, whether you've never heard about it, you're intimate with it, you're a student, you're a technologist, whatever, so you wouldn't be bored or think that this is like, not worthy of your time. You do the same thing at the markup, just mm -hmm. bring in info, disseminating it, putting it out into the world. So I wonder if you have something, knowing the audience that we're presented with right now, the smartest kids in town, it's not just a generalist sort of, this is rudimentary <laughs> knowledge for you. What message would you have from your CEO column for this audience about this <laughs> subject? You can do something. Right, it's very easy to watch things and just feel like time to turn on Netflix and binge ice cream because I'm stressed out. And that, and, and like, I, I just want you to remember that's by design. When people say this problem is too big, it's too complicated, we can't do anything, we have to wait and see about whether you're gonna be harmed before we regulate it, that's not an accident, okay? That's to get market share. That is a way to profit. Uh, and, and I think there's so much that we can do, so I just wanna remind people Consume the information, right? Get it, feel it, take that fear and have it motivate you to do something. And at the markup, we try to frame the problem in a way that you know what the on-ramp is to do something. So we publish our data sets so you can do more research. We publish, we make tools, right? We built a real-time privacy inspector called Blacklight that has 10 million users. Check to see what websites you use all the time that are stealing all your data. It turns out the Purina dog food Website takes a lot of data. I didn't know that, and now I have to go to the grocery store, and um, I, which also takes your data, by the way. But that's you can read about that at the markup. Um, you know, maybe it's political engagement. Maybe it's if you're a developer, if you're a designer, you build something different. You ask a question. You say, did we did we bias audit this? Did we stress test this? You can be that voice, and if you're an investor, you can set incentives. Right? There is something for everyone to do. You just got to pick your lane. Pick it, stay in it, keep doing it. And that's what I would say from the CEO tip. And thank you for that news you can use. We're on to you, Purina. Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, I'm sorry that I dangled that carrot because we are on our last two minutes. So I, I hope that you'll stay and mix and mingle and t tackle each of these uh, geniuses. But I just want the shortest answer you've ever given. I, uh, I, I ripped this from an article that Dr. Timnit Gebru was uh, from last week's, help me, The Guardian. You've all read it. So the thing that I pulled was a quote where she said, we need regulation and we need something better than just a profit motive. 
So in the service of a short answer, give me something that better than a profit motive for what we're engaging in in technology right now. Very sphinx-like. Public good. Used to mean something. We built libraries out of it. Like, we've done stuff with that. We could do it again. I think um, a tool that you find reduces inequity would be my like, goal. Um, yeah. I'll take two things real quick. Values-based leadership, because it starts at the top. And then the other part, too, is like, as somebody who's participated in redistricting, I know that, as you saw some of the data, the impacts, the remnants of the, the redlining, we're living in digital redlining right now. And as we continue to push more tech without actually fix, fixing the infrastructure, we're creating even more and more, uh, I, I would say, this digital discrimination that needs to be tackled now. Nabiha Saeed, Dr. Crystal Grant, Lily Genghis, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Go to batimpa.org. Right.